I speak to you in the name of one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Please be seated. You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. For the past several weeks, our readings from the epistle of James have displayed the author's propensity for extremity. Two weeks ago, St. James said, whoever keeps the whole law but fails in one point has become accountable for all of it. Last week, he said, the tongue is a fire, itself set on fire by hell. And today, as we heard, he says, you want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. My friends, it would be tempting to hear the brother of Jesus speak in such extremity and simply dismiss his words. Surely, we run the risk of thinking, St. James can't be serious. And yet, how many of us have ever heard someone near us or perhaps even ourselves say something like, I'd kill for that. I'd kill for that promotion with the corner office. I'd kill for a car like that. I'd kill for a stack of pancakes right about now. St. James might just be on to something here. The 20th century French anthropologist and philosopher René Girard has a name for the dynamic that St. James describes, the dynamic at play when we say even facetiously, I'd kill for that. Girard calls this dynamic mimetic desire. Mimetic desire. The basic idea is this. All humans have the same basic needs. Oxygen, water, food, shelter, human contact, and so on. And if I hold my breath, I have an innate desire for air. If I skip lunch, then I have an innate desire for food. No one has to tell me to desire these things. I just do. They are innate. But something strange happens when humans have all of our basic needs met. We still desire more, don't we? But the things that we desire are no longer innate. For example, a child is not born with an innate desire for a Rolls Royce or a pair of Gucci loafers. Such desires are socialized. We learn them from watching others. We mime the desires of those around us. We mime them. They are mimetic desires. We see the things that others have, the things that they pursue, the things that they possess, and suddenly, wouldn't you know it, we want those same things too. If you are a parent of siblings, then you likely witness mimetic desire pretty routinely. For example, say there's a toy lying on the ground that neither child is interested in at the time, but then one of those siblings goes and picks it up to play with it, and suddenly that other sibling wants to play with that toy too, and no other toy in the entire house will do. And without your parental intervention, those siblings will fight over that one toy, even violently. The toy that moments ago neither of them had any interest in until the other decided to want it. That is mimetic desire playing out at the earliest stages of human life. And the great tragedy of human civilization, Gerard says, is that like those two siblings, all social groups, be they villages, nation states, churches, will fight over the objects of their mimetic desire the finite resources of luxury, prestige, wealth, power. And apart from some external intervention, those social groups will war with one another to the point of mutual annihilation. This mimetic desire 
is what St. James calls the wisdom of the world. Bitter envy, selfish ambition that is earthly, unspiritual, devilish. It is the wisdom of the ruler of this world, the thief that comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Listen again to the words of St. James with a bit of my own translation thrown in. Those conflicts and disputes among you, where do they come from? Do they not come from your cravings that are with, at war within your members? You want something and do not have it, so you commit murder. And you covet something and cannot obtain it, so you engage in disputes and wars. Mimetic desire means that if we want something that someone else has and we know that we can't have it, we will kill for it in some way. But the murderous violence of mimetic desire does not end here, my friends. For there is an external intervention, something that safeguards group order and prevents mutual annihilation, something that Gerard calls a scapegoat. A scapegoat. When mimetic desire has reached a fever pitch and the subsequent rivalry has thrown the social group into abject chaos, the group will collectively target an individual member of the community or a subgroup within it as the source and cause of all of its conflict. And in short order, like the literal scapegoat in Leviticus chapter 16, the targeted individual will be violently expelled or eliminated from the community as an expiation for the sins of the whole. And scapegoating is routine across human civilization. We see it most severely happening to the Jews in Nazi Germany. We see it supremely casually happening to both Democrats and Republicans in the cycle of American elections. But we see it happening ultimately to Jesus of Nazareth in the cross. The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. My friends, why does Jesus have to die the way that he does? Would it not be sufficient if he were to just slip on a banana peel and hit his head? Why must he be betrayed into human hands to be tortured to death on a cross? St. James and Gerard reply in unison, because of mimetic desire. Because of the mimetic desire of Rome, of the religious establishment in Jerusalem, even of Jesus' own disciples, all of them are arguing over the same question. Which one of us is the greatest? Who will come out on top? All of them are warring over the same object of mimetic desire, greatness, to be a great one upon the earth. All of them would kill for the rank that Jesus alone holds. They'd kill to be the greatest of all. They'd kill for his unparalleled authority and power. And they do kill for it. Or at least they try. Rome holds that trial. The religious establishment incites a mob. And St. Peter, well, he wields a sword. But before the day is done, Jesus is led outside of the city and killed. So my friends, why does Jesus have to die the way he does? Why is he betrayed into human hands and tortured to death on a cross? Because he is the supreme scapegoat that bears the sins of every human social group. He is the one who absorbs all the chaos and the violence of human civilization into himself. Jesus expiates, he takes away the bitter envy, the selfish ambition at the heart of all human violence. The violence of Rome, the violence of the religious establishment in Jerusalem of the disciples, of you and me. Jesus dies the way he does because he is the ultimate victim of our mimetic desire. 
But violence and death, my friends, are not the end of our mimetic desire. Just as they are not the end of Jesus' role as the supreme scapegoat, yes, the Son of Man will be killed, and after three days he will rise again. And indeed, he is risen. Jesus, the vindicated victim coming out of the tomb, is now the supreme object of our mimetic desire, the supreme object of mimetic desire for those of us who have been baptized into his death and now feed on his flesh and blood. That which Jesus desires, we should desire. That which he has, we should desire to have. And as he has previously told St. Peter, The only possession that Jesus carries is a cross. In the life of the church, in God's new order for human society, we are re-socialized to desire that which Jesus desires. In fellowship, holy reading, prayer, service, and above all, in the sacraments, you and I learn to mime Jesus We learn to mime the incarnate wisdom from above that St. James describes, the one who is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, willing to yield, full of mercy and good fruits. If Jesus is the object of our mimetic desire, then we will be like him. And if we become like him, then not only will our desires be transformed, but so too will our means of fulfilling those new desires. For we will no longer live according to the wisdom of the world, trying to seize for ourselves the objects of our desire for our gratification, our pleasure, as James says. Rather, we will live according to that wisdom from above, praying for that which we desire, not for our sake, but for God's. My friends, Jesus is the one human in history who has never had the thought, I'd kill for that. Instead, he looked upon our bitter envy, our selfish ambition, and thought, I'd die for that. I'd die for them. He desires to change our desires, so he made himself the scapegoat to end all of our scapegoating. Therefore, let us, like little children, unarmed, far from greatness, draw near to the cross of him who deigned to die for our sake. Let us draw near to him in fervent prayer this hour, that he may draw near to us, and that we may be made more like him. Amen.